with demand expected to come back. But the question remains, does this mean the economy is back on track? Companies now, after experimenting with offshore in places like India, Philippines, and Poland, want to bring those jobs back. We invest in the U.S. We're the biggest exporter in the country. In the cycle and right now, we're creating jobs. From Radio America, it's Neil Asbury's Made in America, the show that explores American industry, large and small, and promotes American-made products everywhere. Put Neil Asbury's Made in America to work for you. A very big welcome to you today. I'm your host, Neil Asbury, together with co-host Dr. Rich Ruffin. Rich, I mean, we got a really, really great show today and a lot of very, very important topics to talk about, but uh, this week... <laughs> A couple of really big things happened. Many, many big things happened. We're never going to be able to get to them all, but a couple of things really stick out. Five million, actually more than five million, Mm -hmm. um, Americans uh, have filed for unemployment uh, this past week. Right. Since the last reporting. Since the last reporting. So we're like around 21 million Americans. Yeah, close to 22. Yeah, 21, 22 Uh million Americans Uh out of work. I mean, uh, uh, amazing. And and I saw a graph uh, the other day. It, It was sent to me. And if you looked at all of the jobs that were created from 2008 until just a few weeks ago, Mm -hmm. um, all the jobs that were created over that period of time, more than a decade, and, you know, after, you know, coming out of the 2008 financial crisis and, you know, we kind of struggled for a few years, but then things started to come together. Then, you know, President Trump gets elected and then, you you know, uh, record unemployment and all of that. Just within the last few weeks, we've lost more jobs than were created during that more than a decade. And some of that, some of those years, like really, really great years for adding jobs. That's how big and that's how dramatic the loss of jobs have been over the last few weeks. We've just, it's, it's unimaginable. Yeah, well, I, I totally agree with you. And, and, uh, and there are going to be consequences to this that most people aren't even thinking about. You have 21 million, 22 million people. That's about, what, 15% unemployment right now That's in the right. United States? That's right. And these people are not functioning. These people are not paying. And you can fill in that box, whether it's going to be a car payment, whether it's going to be a credit card payment, whether it's going to be a mortgage payment, whether it's – although they do have tax, a – Tax payments? Well, to, no, no, that, know, that's our, been put off uh, for a while. Help run our government? So that's been put off for a while. Yeah. But the point of the matter – well, yeah, I guess in the long run, yeah, the, the, the money's not coming into the capital. The money's not coming so, in, in, into our government. So you know, to what provide do you think is going to happen with all of that, that so in reality? Like that. What's the real-time answer in all of this? This is a – this is – outrageous that most people don't even catch on to yet because i really i'm telling you right now if we have 20 we're not done oh we're not we're not done cuomo announced this week he wants to keep it going until may 15th oh it's okay we're gonna we're gonna say and then we're gonna analyze it again based on the numbers we can have a conversation about the numbers that keep changing sort of like las vegas oh well virginia you know i was talking to someone yesterday in virginia and the governor of virginia has shut down the economy until uh, june 10th or something like that yeah. already he's announced yeah. that yeah. i mean uh, an amazing thing and i mean last week it was 6 million the the week before that it was 6 million this week it's 5 million so the numbers aren't going down i mean it, it, it's 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 still a very scary number i can only imagine what's next week well let me tell you something this week we saw five states have protests by folks who have had enough of this nonsense and they want to get back to work not only that, they want to get out of their house. Better yet, in Michigan, they want to go to a big box store and they may want to buy some bounty and they may want to buy a hose without going to jail. Or they might want to go to their second home up in the, up yes. in the northern uh, or part of the Or play catch state. with their, with their yep. daughter at the beach. Oh, my I don't God. Know. I'm telling you, they will not put up with this, Neil, at some point. These are Americans. Americans don't take this lightly. Yeah, and I also want to talk about the uh, the small business uh, uh, PPP uh, uh, paycheck protection plan. You know, we we're fortunate <laughs> just by the... By the by, the, 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 the nick of time, we got our money in from the program uh, just yesterday, and by yesterday evening, there were media reports that the the program had already exhausted all its funds. The money that's needed by our small businesses has run dry, and, and Washington is not together on this, and it's still a huge mess. And if they don't get this money to our small businesses, that job number is going to be so much oh, uh, so much worse. Not only is it worse, Neil. When we do get back, and God knows when that's going to happen, maybe we'll find out a little bit more this week from the president. But when we do get back, the jobs won't be there anymore because a lot of the companies are going to go bankrupt. Well, we're going to talk about that here yep. in a moment. 
Because that's a I'm that's a topic about that's that. on the we show. We have to today. talk about this. Hey, what we're very this segues very well uh, to our to our first guest who's joining us right now, Don Stenberg, who is the former Nebraska state treasurer, and he's going to talk to us. What does it look like uh, when we start getting Americans back to work? Don, welcome to Made in America. Well, thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. So, well, I think you've uh, done a great job of, uh, of, of explaining the the critical situation our economy is already in after just a few weeks of this more or less nation shutdown of uh, business, about 22 million people unemployed uh, over in just four four weeks. Um, probably tens of thousands of businesses will never will never reopen again. Um, and a lot of political leaders don't seem to be in any hurry to to uh, get us back to work. Um, there are estimates by some economists that uh, it won't be long before we'll see 20 percent uh, unemployment uh, numbers. And, uh, you know, we need to get the country back to work. And I, in my opinion, we need to do it by very early uh, in May or, or we're going to see even more uh, economic damage. Well, I agree with that. I mean, uh, again, we, we were discussing uh, Steve Moore, the economist Steve Moore's commentary over the last few weeks. And, and uh, we, we know Steve well. He's been on the show many times. I have never seen him look so concerned. You could see it in his face, see it in his eyes. And he uh, exactly what you just said, Don, that we cannot go beyond the beginning of May and start putting people back to work. We need to move that cash and get people functioning again. This is a very telling moment right now in American financial history. So, Don, you know, what we're seeing, you know, is kind of like this red state, blue state uh, 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 sort of dynamic. You know, you have Republican governors who are saying, hey, man, we got to get back to work. We've got to find a way to get back to work. You know, what are we going to do? What's it going to look like? And you have blue states, you know, just kind of upping the ante, it seems like, you know, with more and more restrictions and more and more restrictions. Uh, I saw the the governor in New Jersey uh, last night, a nice man. He talked very well. I could see he was a very passionate man. And he had a big heart and he's trying to do the right thing. But he's, he's talking about, you know, like this thing is going to go on and on and on. And, you know, you know, if there's one life that's in jeopardy, you know, then we're going to have to just shut the whole thing down. And um, it's think, of, Don, think about all the lives that's in jeopardy because people don't have jobs. Think of all the anxiety, the depression, the uh, substance abuse, alcoholism, uh, uh, abusive uh, relationships, you know, with your spouse or with your children. I mean, the damage of this is going to be so much greater. I mean, no, it's 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 OK that you're, we're, we're really concerned about, you know, someone who may get coronavirus and, you know, they have underlying conditions and, you know, they may not be able to handle it. But but who's who's talking about the, the, the countless millions of other people who are going to also suffer, if not more suffer? because of this economy being shut down. I mean, it just doesn't seem like it's well-balanced to me. Well, I think you're exactly exactly right, and there's almost no discussion amongst that among a lot of political leaders. But I, I think there's a point here that, that, um, that gets overlooked here that's very important, and that is that we were originally told the reason uh, for these extreme uh, measures to, to lock down our economy were for the purpose of flattening the curve. And what that meant was we want to not reduce the total number of infections that will occur, but we want to spread those out so that our hospitals and medical professionals are not overwhelmed and unable to to handle the the caseload of people coming to the hospital. Well, now around the country, uh, we're very close to having um, to having the curve leveled. Uh, the number of uh, hospitalizations and deaths had been way under what was originally. Uh, projected. So the stated objective of doing all this has largely been achieved in most parts of the country. And now they're moving the goalposts or some of the politicians want to move the goalposts and say, well, we can't do anything until we've got a vaccine uh, or we can't do anything until we're sure nobody else is going to going to die. And this is all out of proportion to to the history of our nation. And I know that there's some folks out there that don't like to compare some of the numbers to the flu, but they are they are important. For example, uh, the number of cases we've had of the coronavirus right now is about 640,000. Well, in the 2017-18 flu season, there were 45 million cases of the flu, 70 times more cases of the flu than we've had 
we've had of the coronavirus. And probably an even more important number is, okay, how many hospitalizations are we talking about? And according to the COVID tracking project, there have been about 68,000 hospitalizations for the coronavirus so far. But in the 17-18 flu season, there were 810,000 hospitalizations, 12 times as many. And yet nobody at the, in those years, and that was only a couple of years ago, said that we need to lock down the whole economy to deal with this issue. So the numbers, to me, prove that we need to open up, that, that, uh, that what's been done, whether it was justified at the time, is not justified uh, to continue to do this. Um, and uh, you've already pointed out very clearly some of the horrendous, not only economic effects, but personal effects on, on the lives of millions and millions of Americans. So, Don, you know, we're going to have to take a, a quick break. But, hey, Don, when we come back, you know, I'd like to uh, talk to you about, you know, what does it look like when we do open up? And, you know, what might the new normal look like? And how might we be living our lives somewhat differently? We're on with Don Stenberg. He's former Nebraska State Treasurer, together with Dr. Rich Rothman. Myself, still so much more to talk about. Stay with us. Made in America. Welcome to Made in America. I'm your host, Neil Asbury, together with co-host Dr. Rich Rothman, and we are together with Don Stenberg, former Nebraska State Treasurer. So, hey, Don and Rich, I'd uh, like to get on a conversation right now about what will the economy look like? What, you know, how would it be when, when we start getting back uh, to normal or whatever that new normal might look like? You know, one of the things I think is that we're going to be seeing people wearing masks. I mean, masks are going to be like everywhere. And uh, I, I, I got to tell you, in my business, I mean, we've been in, we've been getting inquiries for masks like you wouldn't believe it. I mean, I think everybody and if you're a food service operator, if you're managing uh, uh, health care uh, uh, operations, your nursing homes, you know, prisons, you know, whatever it is, wherever you have public and a lot of people getting together, you know, masks, masks and more masks. So I think that you're going to see people wearing a lot of masks. I think when you go into a restaurant, you're going to see the waiters and the, and the people working um probably even the uh, bartenders, everybody is going to be wearing masks. I think we're going to just see a country of masks here for a long time. I mean, I I lived in Asia for many years, and whenever there was a flu season in Asia, you know, you're in Hong Kong, you're in Seoul, you're in Tokyo, you're in China, you're in Taiwan. You know, everybody's wearing masks, you know, and I said, wow, that's interesting. You know, everybody wears masks here. It just seems like six months out of the year. And in America, like nobody wears masks. Well, well, because when you go to Beijing, we've all been there. Beijing and well, Hong Kong's better than Beijing. Beijing, you can't even see the sky. So they're wearing the mask so they can't but breathe. Even, but even in Tokyo, because, you know, the, 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 it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's exactly. good. Exactly. Yeah, but, the, but the, it's the Japanese people, do it, too. The Japanese people do are, it, too. They're, they're so tight. Like, everybody's in, in such like, like they're they're always in each other's face. And so I think we're going to see that, you know, and, and Don, the thing that, that concerns me, you know, as an entrepreneur and, um, you know, all the restaurants out there. And if they say, like, oh, you know, you can only seat people at every other table. There's many restaurants that are just too small to have 50 percent of their capacity to be taken away. And then all of a sudden, you know, is it even worth opening for 50 percent of the business? And I know a lot of restaurants I love to go to fit into that category that they will not be able to survive or they're going to be taking massive increases to the cost of of their service. Uh, you know, a lot of things are going to change. What do you see, Don? I mean, how do you see things changing in, in, in your local community? Well, I think it depends in part on what uh, what uh, the government does. And what I would like to see is basically get rid of all virtually all of these uh, restrictions and, and get the government out of the business of saying how many tables you can have or what business can be open or what hours they can have. Uh, because to me, I think... The, the businesses, any business that's going to deal with, with uh, retail customers uh, is going to have to convince those customers in order to, to get them in the door that it's a safe place to be. And how they do that will depend on the business. It will depend on local communities, how people in local communities are. And so the, the business, they may have all their employees wear masks. They might even have masks available for customers who come in the door that want to have them uh, in that business, or they might set the tables farther apart, or 
um, you know, they might take the temperature of everybody entering the business so that nobody there has, has a fever. But I would leave all that up to the individual business owners' decisions uh, because people aren't going to come. Uh, people are scared right now, probably more than they need to be, but it is a serious illness for, for, for people that are very susceptible to it. What concerns me, Don, is that we are eroding the inalienable rights that we have for the greater good. And, and I think what you said is very applicable. We can deal with the greater good by being smart about what we're doing, but we do not have to give up our rights that we fought so hard for. Because once you give them up, I am concerned it's a hard road to get back. Well, I'm very concerned about that, too. Another hat that I've worn, I was the state uh, attorney general here for 12 years, some some years back. And so I've got a legal, legal background. And um, as the numbers come down, as the number of cases declines, um, there gets to be a greater and greater question of whether the courts would uh, allow these measures to continue, because we're definitely restricting a lot of... Uh, a lot of constitutional rights, uh, freedom of association, uh, freedom of religion, uh, the list the list goes on, the right to travel. Um, and so the, these extreme measures can only be legally imposed, if, if at all, if there is a genuine emergency. And with the passage of time, the hospital rate uh, uh, admissions coming down, there's a really good legal argument that, that we're at the point where there's not enough of an emergency to constitutionally support the continuation of these measures. And I would not be surprised to see some some lawsuits brought along those lines if some of these blue states uh, lock their economies down for for very much, uh, very much longer. Hey, Don, thanks for being on the show. I mean, you've been a a wonderful guest. Uh, Don Stenberg, former Nebraska state treasurer. Uh, a great commentator on on what's happening in, in events here in the United States. We really appreciate you being with us, Don. Well, thank you. And I got a book out, eavesdropping on Lucifer, that um, that actually deals with some of these issues, and uh, been endorsed by former U.S. Attorney General John Ashcroft. Eavesdropping on Lucifer, available at Amazon.com and BarnesandNoble.com. Well, very good. Hey, Don, congratulations on that. It's not easy to get published. Great, great stuff. Thank you very much. We're- uh, we've had a real good response so far. So um, while people are sitting home, if they are looking for something for an interesting book to read, eavesdropping on Lucifer is what I'd recommend. <laughs> excellent, excellent, excellent. Hey, Don, thanks for being on the show. Coming up, we have Arthur Bloom from the American Conservative. We're going to talk about the deep, deep contacts that China has within the American media. A very fascinating topic. Arthur's going to be with us just in a moment. Made in America. After moving sharply higher at the open, stocks continued to perform well over the course of the day Tuesday. And I think that bodes well here over the next couple of years for having bigger demands coming to this country. Now, more of Neil Asbury's Made in America. Welcome to Made in America. I'm your host, Neil Asbury, together with co-host Dr. Rich Rothman. And we are now being joined by Arthur Bloom from the American Conservative. He's uh, the managing editor, a very important position there. A lot of great pieces. I like to read them. And Arthur's always there with with wonderful insight. He's got a couple of uh, articles out right now. One that we're going to start talking about, though, is China's long tentacles extend deep into American media. I think that's a a very appropriate topic to to discuss and to debate. Uh, And again, Arthur, thanks for coming with us today. We really appreciate that you're with us. Hey, I'm glad to be here. So... um, very fascinating piece and uh, a, a very important piece. You know, I I wish we could just all live together and get along. And, you know, I mean, look, the United States, China, you know, China will be at some point the world's largest economy. You know, China's not going anywhere. The United States is not going anywhere. Um, it's kind of natural that you're going to have some sort of a rivalry between between us. But at the same time, you know, the world is getting smaller. We have to share this planet. 
and something that even happens in a in a in a more remote area of each of our countries can create you know an amazing in 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 havoc you know for the whole world and what happened in china has impacted the united states like nothing ever in our history uh so it just shows how connected that we are and um you know, but still, you know, the messaging coming out of China and the messaging coming out of the United States about this whole thing is like, I mean, you know, we just we are just like like on, on, on total opposite ends of the universe. I mean, it's not like we're even sharing this planet anymore. And as you point out in your piece, and China's got really deep relationships within the media here in the United States. And you could see that playing out on television, you know, all the time. And even uh, in the Rose Garden. Yeah, you know, even in a rose garden. Even in the rose garden. You know, in the debate that's going on, you know, of what happened and when it happened and, you know, what do we got to do about it? It's raging in this country. So tell us about, you know, China's relationships within the media and the way that they're able to message, uh, you know, what they want to get across. Well, uh, I'm glad you started with the idea of kind of our, our economic interconnections, because I think it's actually important just to start there, because these media companies, uh, as I'm sure your listeners know, are by are far from the only companies that do a substantial amount of business in China. This, uh, like right now, the coronavirus, it seems like it's going to force us to kind of reevaluate those ties a little bit. Uh, and so, media is kind of only a small part of that. And it seems like the companies that are invested in these relationships uh, are, at least to some extent, on the opposite side of where the opinion of the American public seems to be. Um, and the reason why that matters specifically for media is this is a business that is very much involved in shaping people's perceptions. Uh, it's involved in uh, the, the information that we get and that kind of thing. And so there's the, there's the piece that's uh, the kind of the, the connected relationships uh, across the Pacific Ocean. And then there's also the fact that these media conglomerates are kind of larger than they've ever been. There have been a number of pretty significant mergers uh, just in the last couple of years. Uh, and so we now have these big media companies that are integrated uh, in a way that, uh, you know, Andrew Carnegie or something would be proud of. Uh, you know, in, instead of owning the mines, the refineries and the railroads, they're integrated, uh, you know, owning like the same company that hooks up your Wi-Fi is also bringing you Saturday Night Live. And it's also bringing you news about China. Uh, and so. There, there are a, a couple of these companies that are kind of especially worth kind of talking about. You, um, you mentioned the Rose Garden thing. I mean, the, the, that's pretty simple to understand. That's a uh, basically uh, like a puppet news organization of the Chinese government. But the relationships with China that these big news companies have, and, and the worst offender in this area is definitely Comcast, um, are a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, and so the, the, the piece that I kind of wanted to get to um, when I wrote about this subject uh, was exact. So when you do business in China, basically they have leverage over you. Uh, and the example that I that I uh, pointed out was this uh, Universal Studios Beijing, uh, which is set to go on online next year. And so billions of dollars have been invested into this thing, and it's a public-private partnership between uh, Chinese state investment and uh, and Comcast. Uh, and, and so it's a significant amount of money, but it hasn't started making any returns yet. And so does that give China leverage over how NBC, which is part of Comcast, uh, covers this issue? And I would argue that's something we need to pay a lot more attention to. Well, I think you're right, you know, in terms of these amalgamations in, in the media business. Uh, it's, it's greatly reduced from what it was, and it seems, you're right, very monopolistic in, in areas such as Comcast, AT&T. They do hold a big sway in what's going on in the world. Disney's another example. Disney wound up in, in, in China. They have a huge investment in China. They have a huge investment in media in the United States. So you know, it looks like a handful of people really can – you're right. You're, you're, the robber baron conversation of the late 1800s is so applicable that a handful of people control a lot more than thought in, uh, and really can sway that thought when they have that conversation and also where the money's going. So and, and money's the trail. So, you know, where do you go with this? Because it appears right now we're finding out in the last 48 hours, we found out, you know, in terms of the the uh, the uh, uh, the, uh, the virus uh, starting out in Wuhan and, and breaking out. And uh, the Chinese knew about it days in advance. The WHO gave cover for that. And now we're going after that pretty, pretty significantly with a lot of evidence. But. You find out the American media is like, wow, wait a minute, you know, that's a distraction. 
That's a distraction. So they take the Chinese side. It appears that the truth, it's almost like a 1984, you know, the novel 1984. It almost as if we were in 1984, the truth is really what it's, you know, expedient. Right. And, uh, and I, I think we should also be clear that not all companies, uh, uh, the big ones that we're talking about are kind of equally bad in this regard. Um, just in the last, like, two years, I think, uh, Fox sold all of its Asia operations to Disney. Um, but even Disney itself, which is also the owner of ABC, which is why it's relevant to this conversation, um, Disney has uh, probably the longest standing relationships in China. Um, but in terms of ABC's footprint in the American media, it, it doesn't even really, it pales in comparison to NBC, which has three pretty big television stations. So that's kind of, the, that, that's the reason why I wanted to focus on that one. It just kind of, it looms a lot larger. And then also uh, Viacom, which is the owner of CBS, uh, they, they've, you know, made some somewhat encouraging moves in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, they're exploring selling their Chinese television stations. And then also, uh, you may remember that, that South Park episode where they kind of poked the panda, so to speak, uh, w- with that uh, uh, episode about Chinese censorship. And so, um, you know, in terms of where do we go from here? Well, maybe a good way to think about this in terms of economics is uh, how do you persuade um, how do you persuade NBC to write off Universal Studios Beijing as a loss, right? Uh, it, it, I guess it would take enough Americans being disgusted by that relationship that they're losing more business here, right? Uh, that, that would be one way. Or, uh, you know, if, uh, for example, um, the, the Chinese government pulled the residency permits of all of these pretty high-profile reporters last month uh, from uh, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, a few other places, uh, no NBC reporters were on that list. Well, if you're the company and you're interested in kind of restoring credibility, start covering them in a tough way. Maybe it gets you kicked out, but uh, it, it makes you look better to the American people, I think. Hey, Arthur, we got to take a quick break. We're on with Arthur Bloom uh, from the American Conservative. Still a lot more to talk about. Very, very important topic. Stay with us. Made in America. Welcome to Made in America. I'm your host, Neil Asbury, together with co-host Dr. Rich Rothman, and we're together with Arthur Bloom, who's the managing editor at the American Conservative. So, Arthur, let's uh, you talked a moment ago about the economics and the economics and economics are so important and especially so important in the United States China relationship. I mean, our economies are so intertwined. I mean, we are. I mean, we are relying on each other. And for anybody to think that that is going to change anytime soon, it's just not. It's just not. And I don't care about all the woke politicians in the United States from either coast and a lot of conservatives who are saying, oh, we got to bring our manufacturing back and we got to bring this manufacturing back and our medical supplies and they're all made in China and we're sending all our airplanes over there. We got to bring all this stuff over here. And oh, we should be making this in the United States. But let me tell you, you know, that rhetoric without any action really gets you nowhere because the environment for bringing it back to the United States isn't ripe. It's not ready. And with all the regulation and all the things that's going on in the United States, um, and, and, and if we were to change administrations, and that's a that's a very, very possible uh, outcome of what's going to happen this November to make things in the United States is it going to get so much harder. And it's it, and, and so without the policies that really, really changes why American companies leave our shores. And believe me, I know a lot of these people and they're very patriotic. They, they love their country, but they're forced to go overseas because the conditions in our country are not right for doing the things that they need to do to sustain themselves and be profitable to pay their employees, to pay for health care, and all of that. So, you know, when I'm watching the news and I'm seeing all the, the politicians go there and rail against China and we're going to bring all our manufacturing back and all of that and they can't be doing this anymore, those are empty words to me because the policies that Washington is promoting, by and large, isn't going to bring our jobs back and isn't going to be this manufacturing. And this will pass, and then everything will still be made in China. And the, and the economic relationship between the United States and China will still be as strong and as important as it is today. That's my opinion. What do you say? It's 
disagree with that. Uh, and I think you're letting, uh, you're letting uh, these businesses off the hook a little bit. I mean, it's true that there are stifling regulations, but labor arbitrage is uh, not something the government, you know, can really solve, right? It's just, uh, except saying you can't do it. Uh, and that's basically what they're doing. They're going in search of, of, of cheaper labor. Um, and so... Um, but yes, China labor, uh, but, so but Arthur, I mean, China labor has really risen. And, and let me tell you, the other thing is that the social costs in China, you know, and what you have to pay in addition to the labor in China has also gone way up. You know, it's not as cheap as I think a lot of people believe. And the cost there to do business has greatly escalated. But still, the United States is just doing things to make the cost of doing business even that much higher. Well, sure, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it, but it's still cheaper than, than paying uh, union workers in America, right? Uh, and I, I think, well, there you uh, go, union workers. Well, we can't have union workers because, you know, they're, you know, they're, they, they want to get paid for nothing and for doing nothing many times. Well, not, the for job not even bank. showing up for work. The job bank. Yeah. yeah. Ask the boys in Detroit what they think about the well, job. Well, that's bank. why unions, uh, Rich, we talk about this a lot. Unions are what, only 7% of the private workforce right now. I mean, mm-hmm. nobody's a member of the unions. The unions don't do anything except force jobs out of this country. Well, uh, I, I think uh, I, I think that's a little bit more of a complicated question. I don't really agree, but I don't think we'll get anywhere there. But when it comes to kind of the uh, the question of what we produce, like this kind of the globalized economy of the last 20 years has basically turned the American economy into the strategic soybean reserve of the People's Republic of China. Um, that, that's not a good situation. <laughs> I, I think it's better for America. and It leads to better jobs for Americans when we actually do make stuff. And there are considerations here beyond just, like, getting stuff for cheap. Uh, there are strategic considerations. There are national security considerations uh, behind, like, having to buy all of our rare earth metals from China uh, or something like that. Uh, or finding out that we can't, uh, you know. Arthur, I mean, some- Arthur, just to stop you there, we had the governor of Alaska on uh, just just recently. Last week. Last week. Yeah. And he was telling us that Alaska's got amazing rare earth. But it's regulations that prevent them from getting it. And they were just getting to the point that they could do something with it. So hey, there again, I, I, this you know, of, uh, bam, bam, uh, both feet in the uh, shooting, both feet in the foot at the same time. I, I'm no fan of a lot of environmental regulations. But uh, the fact was uh, that there that there are also things that cause those operations to shut down beyond just regulation. And part of it is dishonest trade practices on the part of China. And that really requires a public response. Hey, Arthur, it's very good. I, you know, you're very good. I, I, I enjoyed our conversation. We I could like have, this dialogue. We could have, we could have went on forever. Man. Why hasn't Arthur been on the show? Yeah, we got Hey, Phil, then. we got to get Arthur. We got to get man. Arthur back, Phil. We he's have to our get kind Arthur of guy. back. He's, he's, he, he sets us straight. He gets us on the right path. Hey, Arthur. No, I like his comment. We're not going to get anywhere with that. That's, <laughs> I'm going to use that, Arthur. That's going to get used on the next show. Hey, Arthur, thanks for being on the show, man. we got to make a hard cut here. Arthur Bloom, the managing editor of the American Conservative. Come back and join us again real soon. Thanks for having me. Coming up, Dr. Rothman and I are going to have some final thoughts for the day. Made in America. Welcome to Made in America. I'm your host, Neil Asbury, together with co-host, Dr. Rich Rothman. So, Rich, great, great show. Unbelievable. I mean, time flies when you're having fun and when you're learning something. Great, great guest today, uh, Don Stenberg, uh, former Nebraska State Treasurer. Absolutely incredible. Excellent guest. Arthur Bloom from the American Conservative. Another great guest. Really, really important topics. Um, but I, I want to talk about one more thing before sure. before we're out of time, and that's about that small business program called the Paytech Paycheck Protection Plan PPP. PPP. I'll make it easy on make you. it make it easy for yeah. me. You know, when it came out, you know, I, I knew how important it was for our our company, right? And I knew that this was absolutely incredible. And you know, we like in the first. The, you know, the first minutes of 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 um, being able to submit applications. I mean, we were there, we're prepared, you know, we were preparing way before because I felt that $350 billion was a lot of money. But immediately after that was released, I'm hearing through, you know, my friends out in the, around the country that this thing is going to get so oversubscribed mm-hmm. 
that you had to know that was coming. That you know I, th- I, this thing is going to be so oversubscribed that there's going to be so many more people applying for this than there are funds. They have and lo and behold, it happened. They have hedge funds applying for this. How outrageous is that? Well, because they're invested in businesses with less than 500 employees. And that's what we consider a small business in the United States. Now, a lot of people might think that a small business is a deli with three or four employees. A small business, according to the U.S. government, is any that's company right. less than 500 employees. That's right. So you could be you know, a, a multi-billion dollar company in the United States and still be a small business. And very sophisticated. They have their teams of accountants and lawyers, and they're ready to go. But if you thought that the starting gun was when you just kind of had to start thinking about it and, you know, getting a hold of the documents and kind of pulling all your information together and, you know, maybe getting with your CPA or your accountant and and, and trying to figure out, you know, how to put this application in. If it wasn't flawless, it gets kicked out and it gets kicked out. It means you go to the back of the line. So you had to get it right. It had to be perfect. So maybe you spent a little extra time to make sure you got it right. Guess what, Rich? You're out of luck because the money's gone. Mm Mm-hmm. And, you know, they've been accepting applications for about 10 days and the wells run dry. The wells run dry. And it was meant, you know, to be able to submit applications until the end of June. Well, <laughs> good luck with that. Well, good luck with that. I mean, Wells Fargo I mean, you're cut out. April, you're at April 15th. Last night, they're already saying that they're out of money. Wells Fargo, within a day and a half, said we've reached $10 million. We're stopping. We're out. We're yeah, out. They're out. Right. They're out. They're out. So, yeah. and if that was your primary lender, then you have to go find another lender. Let who, me tell you, who's if, going to take you? Who's going to take you? Because they're not going to take you if you're not a a, a a good customer of a bank. Good luck of finding someone who will put your application in. And remember, you're not getting the money from the government. I think that's uh, what a lot of people don't realize. But they don't understand that. They're, the SBA is guaranteeing private financial institutions to loan you that money, but mm-hmm. the money comes from the bank. And there's a back-end fee that the banks make from releasing those funds. Now, it's not like a tremendous amount of money. So, you know, they do it for their good customers, but they're just not like doing that as, oh, this is, you know, what we want to do for the next eight weeks. So anyway, oversubscribed very quickly. And there's literally millions of people out there right now that were thinking they're getting that money and they're not until Washington takes action. But what do you think the chances are of Washington coming together? Right now, the well's dry. So if they put more money into that fund, you know, it's going to take, you know, time to get this whole thing up and started again. And again, now you're looking at weeks and weeks before people actually receive the money. I, I don't know if it's going to take weeks it might be and too weeks. Late. No, I don't know. It, well, I, it, it may be too late for a lot of small companies that are really struggling right now. Yeah, they may disappear. That's why our government needs to get off their hands and get this thing done. Right, but Pelosi's not going to do that. Well, Pelosi because they want all the other social stuff. to happen right now. They want all the their, their social leverage, uh, ideologue type of, leverage. Of, of, of programs to be part of the uh, uh, things that have nothing to do but with But let me ask businesses. you a question. So let's say Pelosi comes forth with, a, with a, a litany of things that she wants to have in this. Well, she already has. That's right. So she, well, she hasn't put it. She's going to put them in writing. They're going to debate it or argue it over the next week, maybe, or something like that. Do you think the Republicans should sign off on that and say, wait a minute, this is on you. This is on the Democrats. We don't want the money going to the other purposes right now. It's got to go to the small businesses. Do you think that could happen? Yes or no? Because we're out of time pretty soon. Well, that's a great way to end the show. Um, Tune in next week. Next week, Tune in you're going to know the answer to that. And find out if you got your loan. <laughs> it's not funny. Serious. Well, folks, unfortunately, oh. we're out of time. But we're going to be back again next week for another adventure of Made in America where we never stop fighting for your jobs.